Paulina Poroskova, who is one of the absolutely most beautiful women on the planet, and you're even more beautiful in person <laughs> than even in your photos, which is hard to believe. So come join me on the stage. Okay, so we're so delighted to have you with us today. So let me just get everyone a little bit of background about you. <clears throat> Paulina is a Czech writer who started modeling at the age of 15. By the age of 19, she was a supermodel. She was the first European woman to appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated in 1984. By 1988, she had become one of the highest paid models in the world as the face of Estee Lauder. She's also an actress. She's been in many films. Um, and she was a judge on America's Next Top Model. And at the age of 55, you held this title up until this week. She was the oldest person to appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit. But you have been one up now by the very sexy Martha. <laughs> yeah, damn you, Martha. <laughs> But the great thing is when you turn 80, they'll invite you to come back for the third cover, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Um, but also, it needs to be said, I was not on the cover of Sports oh. Illustrated. I was just one of the girls inside the magazine at the age of 56. So that, uh, I thought that was pretty spectacular as it was. No you know, it's just like one of the, you know, just the, the, the roster of like hot babes in there. And at 56, <laughs> I felt pretty good. <laughs> And by the way, I will say this because you, we're going to talk about your Instagram account because Paulina has over a million followers on Instagram, by the way. And one of the reasons for that, and we're going to talk about this, is because she's just so honest and open and, and people just so relate to her. We just saw it upstairs a few minutes ago with one of your followers on Instagram. It was so excited to meet you and you were so lovely, too, with giving her advice. Um, Dating so, advice. <laughs> so the first thing, the first thing I want, well, let, let me talk about your, uh, the, your Instagram followers, but uh, on Instagram, she talks about, she really pours her heart out, her heartache, her joys, her post of unfiltered photos. I mean, people, when you first did that, we'll talk about that a little bit. Often without makeup, we don't see a lot of celebrities on Instagram doing that for sure. And which is really, you know, why she's so beloved by legions of Instagram followers. So we have a little clip because to give them a sense of, um, of how you feel about aging, can we play the clip now? Aging gracefully. What is aging gracefully? You know what? Aging Fuck that. There's no such thing as aging what gracefully. Aging gracefully? <laughs> you know what? Fuck that. There's no such thing Sorry. as aging gracefully. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Look, aging is inevitable. It will happen to all of us. Look, aging and it's is actually been a rather marvelous thing because I think that I'm a and much better person on the inside than I've ever been. I'm wiser, I'm, I'm much more intelligent, I'm smarter, I'm, I'm funnier, I'm more patient, I'm, wiser, I'm, uh, intelligent, I'm more introspective, I'm I'm I just I'm know more. more. Uh, I'm more introspective, I'm, I just know more. Paulina has written this wonderful book, for those of you who are not aware of it. Oh, we've got some people with the book already. It's called No Filter, The Good, The Bad, and The Beautiful. And let me get my notes, which I just dropped. <laughs> and it is a really beautiful, beautifully written and really thoughtful book about aging, about heartbreak, about grief, about beauty and about relationships. So just to give a little overview so we can talk about this a little bit, your life looked like a fairy tale to so many people. You were a beautiful supermodel, married for many years to a rock star, Rick Okasik, the front man for the cars, and you had a beautiful family, but your book reveals a very different story that ended with heartache, grief, betrayal, and finding yourself starting in midlife. So can you share some of that with our audience? Okay, well, that's a pretty long trip right there. Uh, the highlights. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, let me just start. Um, I'll, I'll just try to make this very brief. Um, when I was three years old, 
I became, um, I, this is when I first became a celebrity, except of course I didn't know this. I became known as a political um, pawn between the East and the West. And this was, my parents had escaped uh, the Soviet invasion uh, by moving to Sweden. They sort of left me behind because they didn't think, you know, tanks and guns and a motorcycle were a great combination for a small child. And also they were too young to realize that uh, things might not go their way once they leave. And of course they didn't. I was stuck, they were stuck, and they basically lost their kid. So they started a big campaign, and this is where, yay Scandinavia house, yay Scandinavia, yay Sweden. Um, the Swedish people really fought for me. Like, they didn't know me, but they just went, um, the, the story of these two young people that had left their child behind and now couldn't get it, um, really, um, the Swedish people, uh, you know, they wrote, uh, whatever it's called, like lists, putting their names down to like to, to try to extricate me from the country and for awareness. The Swedish hockey team were going to play the Czechs in like the friendship games of 1973 and they said they weren't going to play unless they released us. So it got to that level. Meanwhile, I'm just like a happy chubby kid at home with grandma who raised me. And so I had no idea that I was a celebrity, in fact, or that I, you know, that, that my image meant anything to anybody until I hit Sweden. And so this magical country that brought us and that fought for us and then, and then got us there um, suddenly became a bit of a hellhole for me because I'm, you know, I'm just a nine-year-old kid. Um, I was taken away from my grandmother who was really the only mother I had ever known. And I was sort of thrust into this new culture and this new world where teachers in school really liked me. But uh, my peers, the kids, were like, well, you're the, that communist bastard kid that, you know, that you're weird and we don't really like you and we don't want you to be around. So it was an interesting few years in Sweden. Um, and you were bullied at school. I, I was, mean, you, you tell a, story, you know, a yeah. few stories in the book about being uh, bullied. And yeah, you know. I was severely bullied through, through, through all my years in Sweden, which ended at 15 when I got sort of accidentally found and presented to John Casablanca, who said, would you like to go and model in Paris? And, you know, after having my head dunked in the toilet uh, in school, I was like, that sounds like a <laughs> great thing. <laughs> uh, but this is also what showed me in part how fickle and, and, and what looks really mean, because I literally went from one day in Sweden being the girl that nobody wanted to hang out with, and that was called ugly and a moose, um, and couldn't get a date if I had a sawed-off shotgun pointed at somebody, um, to moving, you know, 300 miles away, and suddenly I was beautiful. On my former life, I was ugly, but smart, you know, that was the only thing I had left. So I studied a lot of Roman um, history and listened to Schubert because, of course, you have to be pretentious if you're homely. Um, and then I moved to Paris, and because I am acknowledged as suddenly beautiful, I was also suddenly stupid. And nobody had any interest in what I had to say. Uh, so, and, and, and I remember even then at 15 looking at myself in the mirror and going, what changed? I mean, it's exactly the same person that I was yesterday, and yet the perception of me is completely different. And I think I sort of brought that along into the rest of my life with me. In my career as a model, that I always knew that it really wasn't about me so much, that it was about the perception of me. And the perception of me could change suddenly, on the dime. And I, hadn't, I would have no warning. So to me, what was the most important thing in my life was no, not my career and not the way I looked, but love. Love, the one thing that had been escaping me for my entire childhood. And so when I met my husband at 19 and fell madly in love, that was it. That was what I had been looking for. That's what I needed. That's what I wanted. And what ensued was a really mostly beautiful marriage of... We were married for 30 years. We were together for 33. The last, well, 35, but the last two years we were actually separated and just living together as best friends, I thought. 
And uh, then he uh, unexpectedly died. And uh, this is when my world came to a screeching halt because not only had the man that I had loved my whole life um, died and I found him dead while bringing him a cup of coffee, um, but, uh, you know, it was, it also sort of, it, it eliminated everything I knew, everything I was, because I had built my life around my husband, around my family, and so it's like the North Star was removed and I had no compass to navigate by. Then additionally, I don't know how many of you know this, but he uh, um, disinherited me in the will, um, said I didn't have, uh, uh, he, he didn't want me to get a portion of his estate because I had abandoned him, uh, which was a patent lie. Um, but I think it was a sort of legal speak for why I shouldn't, you know, he had to have a reason to, 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 to do this. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and okay, fine. You know, the loss of money and the financial insecurity after he died, all of that was in no way made me feel better about things, but I was feeling so bad already that it, that itself wasn't, wasn't the worst part of this. The worst part of it was that it was a, I'm sorry, I might well up a little bit here, um, that the man I loved and trusted infinitely and explicitly uh, left me with this, with this sort of betrayal that, and I, I just, I didn't see it coming. I didn't understand it was even possible. And so um, that was a, an emotional wake-up call that I didn't have the muscle for. I had never encountered that before, and it was, uh, it was hard. It was a really well, tough I time. I do think of all the feelings we go through, betrayal is definitely one of the very hardest for anyone to deal with. But what you did then, I think, was, was so interesting, because not only was obviously shocking, you were grieving, you felt betrayed. This all happened during lockdown too, right? No, this is right, right before. Yeah. Right before the lockdown. So now you're 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 dealing with all of that and you turned to Instagram. And in fact you became known as the crying lady on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, there's actually an essay in my book. I think I might be. Um, I think my book might be starting with this: the crying lady of Instagram. And I'm just going to give you a little outline. I went into a, um, you know, this is a couple of years later after my husband's death, and I had um, been on Instagram. Um, I sort of turned to Instagram after my husband died and then COVID happened and I didn't know what my financial situation was and I had to immediately sell my house because I didn't have enough money to live on. Uh, and of course it's COVID, so try to sell a house in COVID in New York City, like where everybody's dying, like great timing. Um, so my life was in, a, in an uproar anyway. But then, you know, then the world, again, the world gets shut down. And I, you know, three months after the person that you love that dies, all your friends gather around and they hold your hand and they hold you and they, they're there for you. And six months later, they're still around, but they have their own lives. They can't just sort of dedicate themselves to yours. Nine months later, there's not that many people left that that have the time for you. And a year later, well, you should be fine, right? Like, or like it's been a year, so like you're good, right? Um, and that sort of coincided with COVID. And so I had nobody to grieve with. I had nobody to hold me. I had nobody to be there for me. And this is why I took it to Instagram, because I was so incredibly lonely. I was, yeah, of course I was thinking about, you know, uh, suicide as a, as a, an, a good alternative at this point, uh, if, except of course I had two children that just lost a parent. So like, it wasn't really a possibility. Um, I kept thinking to myself, well, you know what? It's something I can do later. I don't know why well, it's like, I'll just, I'll just oh, wait I'm to kill myself. Suicide. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just do whatever needs to be done and then I'll kill myself. Um, which is actually turns out it's not such a bad idea because every day gets 
tiny, tiny bit easier. So if you can just hang on another day and another day and another day, chances are that one day you'll wake up and you go, oh, yeah, that suicide thing doesn't look that appealing anymore. Um, but uh, so me going on Instagram with my pain really was me casting little messages in bottles saying, help, I'm drowning. And the thing is, everybody was drowning. It was COVID. We were all miserable. I was not the only person that had lost somebody. There were a lot of losses out in the world. There were, I mean, this still kills me when I think of the people that were dying and with their iPads trying to message their loved ones. I'm not feeling so well. And that's the last message they had. I mean, that still just like pulls my guts out when I, when I remember that. But so we found each other. I think the, I think by me deciding to just be honest and vulnerable out in the world because I was so fucking lonely, the people who felt fucking lonely were drawn to me. And then that sort of started creating a little bit of a community. And you know, every day is not boo hoo hoo. I'm feeling really lonely. Some days, you know, I'm cleaning a stupid white tile floor that some tenant before me had installed, and it was impossible to keep clean. And some days there were, you know, good moments. And so I was, I was using it as a sort of diary almost. And um, and, and I've found a lot of friends. I've made a lot of friends. I have actually have a lot of Instagram people that have been following me for the, trailing me for these years that, that I, you know, that I've had coffee with and that I've gone out to dinner with and, um, and some that have actually become like true, really good friends. That's a pretty amazing experience. But then what you've done now is you've taken your Instagram platform and you really are using it now to stand up to ageism and how to see beauty through a different lens. And you talk about when you posted, your, you took a unfil totally unfiltered photo of yourself that you said showed all, you know, your that face, was today. wrinkles, lines. <laughs> and you posted it and you got this most unbelievable amount of comments. So tell us about that and how that has, um, sparked you to use your your Instagram as really a megaphone to really talk to other women about age and growing older and how we feel about ourselves. Well, you know, again, I had no, there was no premeditation behind it. I was just talking about the issues that, that were relevant to me. And I very often felt like, God, wouldn't I love to see, this is even how, you know, I became the crying lady of Instagram. I thought, I... I was crying so much and so often that at one point I got bored and I and I, I videotaped myself with my phone because I was like, I wonder what that looks like. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty gory. Um, and then I thought, you know what? I would love it if somebody that was a peer of mine posted a video of what they look like when they cry because then this wouldn't make me feel so bad. And so I went, well, I guess, you know, that old saying, be the change you want. So I posted it. <laughs> um, and that's sort of what's happened with this, um, you know, uh, fighting the invisibility of being a middle-aged woman um, and, 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 and trying to process the aging uh, naturally, uh, figuring we, you know, we are privileged to be aging. And I can't help but to be a little resentful that we're not supposed to look like we are aging. And that's what kind of what I was saying in this video, that we, you know, great, aging gracefully in our society means not actually aging all that much. <laughs> and this I have a problem with because we all do age, right? So yes, we can take steps to maybe age a little more gently, um, some of us will take steps where we don't age, where we arrest it, or at least visually. But what is so fucking embarrassing about getting older? When getting older is getting better. It really is. Yeah, fine, I have hip arthritis. That's not the hottest thing about getting older. But in exchange for that, I am so much smarter. So that's a fair trade, right? And I am finally at like the age of 58, actually, 
by acquiring a little bit of confidence. Like the pictures that I posted on Instagram with me in full, horrible detail with every flaw of mine visible. And she still looks beautiful, by the way. <laughs> well, no, I've, I've had a few say, girl, you need Botox, and I see a facelift in your future. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's also because my career was about you know, looking beautiful, being the prototype of a woman that you're supposed to look like. Um, age has, I feel, well, humanized me, actually. I mean, it's like, hey, yeah, look, I, I have the same wrinkles as you do, and I have the same slight jowl. I found out that if you smile a lot, the jowl's not so visible, so uh, <laughs> smiling is a good thing. Um, and, you know, even talking about things like you were just talking about Botox and, and fillers, <laughs> and I haven't had anything done, which I think is pretty obvious. But um, the reason, you know, and I'm, most of my friends have, and I look at them and I go, you look great. You absolutely look smoother, therefore younger. But I don't necessarily care to look younger, or at least I'm trying to embrace the privilege that I'm given that I am older. And I'm desperately trying to see if there's a way of making wrinkles and the Im so-called imperfections, or perhaps they're just enhancements of age. Um, can we make them look good instead of offensive and shameful? And I can't do that if I, if I fix my face to suit the current social standards of beauty so that I look like that Twilight 39, well, then I'm not really helping the cause of trying to get older women seen as beautiful for being older. They only get seen beautiful for not looking older. And, and that's, this is the, the relationship. It's sort of an insecure relationship because, of course, until very recently, I was also single. Uh, quite frankly, when you're single in a dating pool in your 50s and all the available men can and do choose women 20 years younger, you do feel kind of shitty about yourself. Um, and the most immediate and the quickest fix to that would be a jar, would be a little vial of Botox. And I guess I just have like an internet natural rebellious streak where I'm like, no, I want to be... I want to be seen for what I am because I haven't been. My whole life I was seen as a paper doll, as somebody that barely existed in human form. I had no feelings. I was pretty. Therefore, you know, I had no other uh, qualities ascribed to me. And also no voice because nobody cared what I said unless I said, I am using Estee Lauder and that's why I look this fabulous. I look that fabulous because I was 24. Um, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> thanks. But so, you know, yeah, I look, I look at my girlfriends and I think, okay, so if you've changed um, prettiness, you've exchanged prettiness for the ability to use your face. And there's nothing inherently wrong or right about that. It's a choice that we have and that we can use. And I think it's a wonderful choice. It's like being able to take you know, a pill for a headache or tough it out. Like, it's, it's nice that you don't have to feel terrible about yourself. Well, and I love you can that in your that. book because you talk a lot about prettiness versus beauty. In fact, you all really have to get Paulina's book. Because yes, you do, you just You've heard just a little bit of her, how your, her approach and how she's thinking about this. But her book, it's, it's philosophical. It, it makes us all think. You are you know, so honest and open about your feelings, which is why you are so relatable to well over a million people on Instagram. And I, I'm, I personally am so grateful that you are using your voice as a megaphone on how we grow older, how we perceive ourselves, how the world perceives us. And we've been talking about that from the start of this day. And to have you here on the stage with, with your megaphone and to be able to share that message with us is really a very powerful message. So I thank, thank you, you so much for being here and joining us. Thank you. And uh, you're just a delight. <laughs>